Shall we turn to the book of James, chapter 4, tonight beginning with verse 11. I love James, so practical. Some of the things I don't care too much what he said, but they are important. Here in verse 11, he tells us that we are not to speak evil one of another or speak evil of a brother. That's a hard injunction to follow, especially when the other person is evil. But there is so much good in the worst of us so much bad in the best of us, it ill behooves any of us to speak of the rest of us. <laughs> when you see someone that is doing something that is so totally bad, you want to just begin to rant and to rave over them. You want to carry on. But when that happens, just think, but for the grace of God, there go I. We need to realize that the capacity for evil is in all of us. Paul said, I know in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. Now, not all of us have come to that acknowledgement. We all believe that, yes, there is some good thing. But if there is, it's of the Lord. It isn't you. It's of the Lord. What do you have but what you have received, Paul said. If you receive it, then why are you boasting as though you didn't receive it? Anything of worth, anything of value that I possess has been given to me by the Lord. Paul says that we were all by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's the natural me. But because of that work of God's Spirit in our lives that has changed us and transformed us, too often we begin to attribute that good that is there to ourselves rather than to the fact that the Lord has made some wonderful transformations in my life. And were it not for those transformations that the Lord has made in my life, I am as capable of evil as the most evil person in the world. In Proverbs 10, 18, Solomon said, He that hides hatred with lying lips, and he that utters a slander is a fool. Throughout the scriptures, we are warned about slandering, gossiping. But it's amazing how that we can justify our speaking evil of a brother. I just wanted to warn them about him because I didn't want him to take advantage and deceive them like he deceived me. So I felt that it was important that I warn them about how evil he is. And so we sort of justify our speaking evil of a brother on, on that basis of wanting to give caution to spare someone to... Now, I think that you can do that without speaking evil. I think that you can say, well, you know, I would pray very earnestly uh, about any kind of dealings uh, that I might go into. Seek the guidance of the Lord. Make sure that the Lord is leading you. And, and you don't have to speak evil 
of them. Many times a person will justify their speaking evil of a brother by declaring that it really wasn't slander because it was true. Well, if it is true, it is still and can be slanderous. Oft times, slander is true, but to repeat it, it becomes slanderous. Oftentimes, we are only passing along gossip that we have heard, and we sometimes do not even know if it was true or not, but someone told us and they were reputable, and thus I pass it along, and I pass it along as fact, when in fact I do not know that it was fact. I think of the tragedy of so many lives that have been destroyed by slander, by stories that were started about them that began to be passed about them. And there have been people that have actually been so slandered that they've committed suicide. And, and I think that those that passed on the slanderous remarks are guilty of that person's death. James tells us that he that speaks evil of his brother or judges his brother is actually speaking evil of the law because he is putting together judging and speaking evil. Uh, the slander is in a sense judging. In Romans 14, Paul said, he that is weak in the faith receive, but not to questionable disputations. In other words, not getting into argument with brothers who are weak in the faith. For one believes that he can eat all things. Another who is weak in the faith eats vegetables. Let him that eats meat not despise him that doesn't eat meat. Let him that doesn't eat meat judge him who does. For God has received him. And who are you to judge another man's servant? For, behold, for before his own master he stands or falls, and yea, God is able to make him stand. Now one man esteems one day above another, Another man esteems every day alike. But let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. For he that regards the day regards it unto the Lord. He that regards not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not and gives God thanks. For none of us lives unto himself, no man dies to himself for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And for this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So this is a classic kind of a example of what James is telling us here, that if we speak evil of a brother, uh, we are judging and we are actually speaking against the law. There are some people who feel condemned about eating meat. They feel that it is a sin to eat meat. We have a pastor in Phoenix, Arizona, Pastor Mark, and for years, he was a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was listening to my radio broadcast years ago when we were going through Romans, talking about the grace of God and justification through faith. And God spoke to his heart, and he realized that uh, 
you know, his endeavor to be righteous by the law uh, was not a real righteousness before God. It isn't the righteousness of faith. It was the righteousness of works. And so he called me and wanted to know if uh, he could sit down and talk with me. And so uh, I said, well, Mark, we're having a pastor's conference over in Verde Valley uh, in a week. Why don't you meet me at this pastor's conference and, and we can talk uh, together? So he made arrangements to meet me at the conference and we sat down and talked and he explained his background as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, but uh, the Lord had really opened his eyes to the grace of God and uh, the justification by faith. And he had left the Seventh-day Adventist church and started a church that he called Calvary uh, Fellowship. He said he didn't want to call it Calvary Chapel, but he wanted to sort of relate it to uh, our teaching, and also he called it Calvary Fellowship uh, there in Phoenix, and uh, God was blessing it, but he was wondering about affiliation with Calvary Chapel. And so we were sitting at lunch, and we were eating, uh, getting ready to eat lunch, and uh, they had fixed a barbecue lunch. And so I said to him, you know, I said, we had a fellow up in Fresno that was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and, and he uh, wanted to affiliate with Calvary Chapel also. Uh, but I said, the problem was the guy was still hung up with a lot of, you know, the, the trappings of, uh, you know, like meat, eating meat and, and stuff like that, you know. He, and, and so he just really didn't fit because he wasn't fully released uh, from, you know, the, the background that he had. And so they passed the uh, barbecue to us and <laughs> he took a big bite of meat and he said that was the first meat he had eaten in his life. He didn't tell me that at the time. But he went home and he said to his wife, Honey, we are really free now. <laughs> but uh, people get hang-ups. Now, those that are vegetarians, they are sometimes very, very convicted against eating meat. And they feel that it is a sin to eat meat. And they have a tendency to judge you as not being spiritual if you eat meat. It's interesting that Paul ties that together with one man esteeming one day above another and so forth, because the seventh day Adventists do both. They esteem the Sabbath day as the proper day to worship God, and uh, they condemned those that worship on Sunday and even went so far at one time within their uh, system of theology as to say that Sunday worship was actually the mark of the beast. And, uh, of course, who would ever take the mark of the beast has no hope for salvation. So they sort of, you know, made that an issue of salvation. Um, fortunately, they have pretty much gone from that radical a view The problem is, I look at those kinds of narrow convictions that really have nothing to do with my relationship with God or with Jesus Christ. I have a tendency to, to look down at that and to sort of ridicule the folly of, of that kind of thought that eating meat would damn me to hell. And so my problem stems from the fact that I have the liberty to eat meat, and when someone judges me for eating meat, I have that tendency of, of just sort of 
looking down on them. Uh, so uh, they have the problem of watching me eat a in and out double-double and say, oh my, what a horrible sinner, you know. So uh, that's what James is talking about. Uh, if I am judging someone because they have a more liberal uh, view on a particular issue that than I have. Now, that's where I have a problem. There are people who have a more liberal view than I have on, on some issues. We were over in Sweden several years ago and with a group of young fellows and uh, they were, uh, talk, we were talking about the Lord, they were Christians, they were in the church over there and, and they were drinking beer. And, and that really shocked me because I don't have that kind of liberty. And uh, I've always felt that that was wrong. All things are lawful, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. But as we were talking, they said, you know what? We hear that there are some people in the States that think they are Christians and call themselves Christians, and they drink coffee. So, you know, it, <laughs> if you esteem something to be sin, to you it is sin. But Paul said, happy is the man whose heart does not condemn him in the things that he allows. I'm glad that I've come to a place, at least I hope I have, that I realize that everybody doesn't have to share my same convictions. That I need to stand before the Lord and before him I either stand or fall and he is able to make me to stand. But it isn't necessary that everybody uh, live by or adhere to the convictions that I have. And if someone feels a greater liberty to do things that I have convictions against doing, I have great difficulty in not judging them in my mind. If I feel a greater liberty in doing certain things than they feel, and they start judging me, I have a tendency to make light of their narrowness. I do believe that what we, what might be wrong for one person to do is not necessarily wrong for another person to do. I was working together with a man. We were, I was taking over his route and he was a minister of a church of God, which Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, and Cleveland, Tennessee, they're, they're two different animals. And the Church of God uh, in Cleveland, Tennessee used to be much more rigid than they are now. Uh, they used to believe that wearing gold was a sin. And uh, even a gold wedding ring uh, the wearing of gold was sin. And uh, they were very legalistic. And so uh, the route that I have was down in Laguna Beach. And as we would drive along the coast, uh, and uh, he, would, he asked me the question, uh, do you go swimming in the beach? And I said, oh yeah, I love surfing. Oh. He said, I would love to do that, but he said, all of those naked women on the beach, you know. Of course, that's the way they describe them. And I said, I don't see them. 
I don't go down to look at women. I go down to enjoy the surf, you know. And uh, yet, if, if that was his mindset, you know, you're going down and being exposed to all this flesh and so forth, and it would have been a problem to him, uh, then I could see where he shouldn't go to the beach. Uh, but you see, you can't really set universal standards for everybody, and I think that this is a mistake that the church has made in the past, in that we try to make our righteousness contingent more upon our activities than upon our faith. And the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the tendency then, if someone is doing something that I have deep convictions against, is my speaking evil of them. Do you know what they did? Boy, you know, when you say that, ears perk up, don't they? Let me tell you what they did to me. What, you know? I mean, we're so ready to hear evil. It's often, though, the very thing that I am judging another person for is something that I am guilty of myself, all you have to do is just change the angle slightly. But it's the same basic thing. When David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband sent into the front lines to be killed, and then married Bathsheba, when his friend, the prophet Nathan, came to him, he said, David, there was a man in your kingdom extremely wealthy. He had flocks of sheep. He had servants. Next to him, there lived a very poor man. All he had was one little ewe lamb, and it was like a pet. It slept next to him at night. It ate, you know, in his tent, and... That's all he had. And this very wealthy man had people that were coming for dinner. He ordered his servants to, by force, go next door and take that lamb from his poor neighbor and butcher it to feed his guest. And David said, that man shall surely die. And then Nathan said, David, you're the man. You have wives, you have wealth, you have all, and yet you took away the wife of this poor neighbor of yours. But you see, all you have to do is, is turn it slightly, and you find that oftentimes you are guilty of the very thing that you are judging another one for doing. And that's why it is so important that we not speak evil of another brother, realizing that if we speak evil of our brother, uh, I am judging my brother and I'm speaking evil of the law. Paul wrote to the Romans, in Romans 2, 1, Therefore, Thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judges. For where you judge another, you're actually condemning yourself. For you that judges are doing the same thing. I guess it all boils down as to when you stand before God, how do you want God to judge you? If I am judging another person by speaking evil against them or about them, I'm not only just judging them, I'm judging the law. And you say, well, how is that? Well, the, Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. So 
That's what the law of the Lord is. In judging others, I'm really setting the standard of the measure by which I will be judged. If I am hypercritical in my judgment towards others, then I will be judged with hypercritical standards. In the same message in which Jesus told us not to judge, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If I am very merciful, then I will obtain mercy. If I am very judgmental and harsh, then I am setting the standards that I will be judged harshly by narrow standards. I'm judging the law because Jesus told me that the greatest law of all is that I should love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. So in judging, if I am speaking evil, of my brother, then in reality, I am violating what Jesus said, that I'm to love my neighbor as I love myself. And so I'm judging what Jesus said to not apply to me. And thus I am judging the law and violating that. If I am speaking evil of my brother, how can I say that the love of God is dwelling in me? If you are judging the law, then you're not keeping the law. James tells us, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you then who judges another? God is the lawgiver. God is the only one who is qualified to judge because God knows our hearts and God knows our motives. And so many times our judgment goes far beyond just what the person did because we presume that they had a bad, wrong motive when they did it when they may not have had it. It may have been just something that they didn't even think of. It could have been just something that they were totally oblivious to, but uh, I have that tendency to judge their motives. We knew a lady who was constantly judging the motives of her children. And, and those poor little kids were growing up under a horrible oppression because she would say, did you see how he was looking when he did that? Do you know what was going on in his mind as though she did? But we don't know what's going on in another person's mind. God declared in Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God sees the heart. He tries the heart. That is something I can't do. And, and for me to judge a person's motive in what they have done is so totally wrong. To speak evil of them and to presume that they were doing it out of an evil malice kind of a thought or whatever is so totally wrong. David prayed, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wake, wicked way in me. And so he recognized that God does search the heart. And David is asking God, search my heart, Lord. I don't even know always my own motives. Jesus said in John 8, 16, if I judge... 
My judgment is true, for I am not alone, but it is I and the Father that sent me. Now, Jesus can judge. He knows their hearts. In fact, we do read in uh, John chapter 2, uh, when Jesus was in Jerusalem there at the Passover, there on the feast day, it says, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he did not need that any should testify to him about a man, for he knew what was in man. So he is able to judge. But that is something that I'm not qualified to do. And, and yet if I am speaking evil against a brother, I am judging him. And thus I am putting myself in opposition to what the Lord commanded me not to do. The Lord not only has the capacity of judging, but he only has the ability to save or to destroy. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Don't fear those that can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I may judge, I may speak evil, but I don't have the capacity of saving or condemning. That's in God's area. David in Psalm 119, verse 120 said, My flesh trembles for fear of thee, O God, and I am afraid of thy judgments. In the book of Daniel, we read of the three Hebrew children. And when Nebuchadnezzar had made that great image of all gold, 90 feet high, and set it up there in the plains of Dura, it was an image that was defying uh, the word of God. He had had the dream. He saw the great image made up of different metals, beginning with the head of gold and then the chest and arms of silver, the stomach of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay. Speaking of the successive kingdoms that would rule over the world. And in defiance to that, Nebuchadnezzar set up this huge image of all gold. It was saying, Babylon will never fall. Babylon will not be replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, or the Roman Empire. Babylon will stand forever. And then to affirm that, they announced the date in which the people were to gather. And the orchestra was there, the instruments. And when the instruments began to play, Everyone was to bow down and worship this image of gold. And it was reported to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, you made a decree that every man, when he heard the sound of the music, should fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever did not fall, fall down and worship would be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these men, O king, have not regarded you, nor do they serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him. So they brought these men before the king. And then Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them and said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? I'm going to give you another chance. 
when you hear the sound of the instruments, if you will fall down and worship the image which I have made, it will be well with you. But if you do not worship, you shall in the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, know this, O king, we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They were basically telling Nebuchadnezzar that they had a greater fear of disobeying God than they had of his burning fiery furnace. For the fire of God is eternal. The fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar would only be for a moment. And so they recognized that their lives were in God's hands. God had the capacity to save or to allow them to be destroyed. And that's basically what James is telling us here in verse 12. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, and who are you then to judge another? I'm afraid that not only is there that danger of gossiping, speaking evil of a brother, but there is also that danger of listening to the gossip, to the slanderous things that are told about another person that causes you to form an opinion about that other person, an opinion that will alter the way you respond and react to that other person and causes you to respond or react in a very unchristian manner because you believe certain things that you have heard about them. And I do believe that it's just as wrong to listen to evil about a brother as it is to speak an evil about a brother. My evil heart loves to hear a bad report about someone that I don't like. Tell me more. You know, we almost lick our lips, you know, wanting to, whoa, really? And we try to egg them on to, to revealing all that they know. And, and that's, that's just as wrong as speaking slanderously concerning another. And so somehow, though, it does give me some kind of satisfaction to hear some evil about a brother because it more or less confirms the feelings that I have concerning them. But it does put me under the same condemnation as the one who is repeating the evil report. There was a fellow who was known for never speaking evil about anyone. No matter who you would bring up, he always had a good word for them. He would not speak in a negative or an evil way. And, and people just knew that this fellow just would not speak evil of another person. So it, it sort of bugged some people, and 
he was with a group and one fellow said, well, what do you think about the devil? And he said, well, you have to give him credit. He really works hard, doesn't he? <laughs> but I think that that's a good policy. And surely we are exhorted by James. It should be our policy never to speak evil one of another brother. Knowing that I'm going into the area that belongs to God and I don't belong there. Father, we look at this commandment and Lord, we must confess that we've all failed here. Either by passing on some evil report that we've heard or by listening and accepting some evil remark about a brother. And so, Lord, we ask forgiveness. We ask for mercy. Help us, Lord, that we also might be forgiving and that we might show mercy, knowing that if I want mercy, I must be merciful. And if I want forgiveness, I must be forgiving. Lord, help us, as James tells us, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So when we come up against injunctions like this, rather than trying to water them down, help us, Lord, to just seek to allow your spirit to help us to obey. Help us, Lord, that we will not speak evil of a brother. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to minister to you tonight. If there's a need in your life, God wants to help you. And so we would encourage you when we're dismissed, come on down. And let the Lord work in your life and in those situations that you are facing that may be causing you sort of worry and concern. As the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so may you experience this night that special work of God in your life. And may we have, each of us, that help of the Holy Spirit that we might be obedient and be loving. Loving as Christ loved us. Forgiving as Christ has forgiven us. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice.